Hello, I'm Jeffrey Algazi. I'm a senior partner uh, with McKinsey's New Jersey office, uh, and I'll be joined today by uh, Ramesh Srinivasan, a senior partner in our New York office. Uh, today, we're speaking to Mark Casper, the CEO of uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific, the world leader uh, in serving science with annual revenues of greater than uh, $25 billion. The company's mission is to enable their customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. Uh, Mark has led the business as CEO since 2009, uh, Mark, thank you for taking the time today to speak to us. Jeff, thanks uh, for having me. Thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific's been one of the early responders in the crisis uh, through the production of diagnostic test kits for COVID. Uh, can you tell us what the last couple of weeks has been like and uh, you know, where are things today? Yeah, so it's been uh, the most uh, intense period, I'd say six weeks of my business career. And in terms of responding to societal pressures, customers, uh, you know, addressing the coronavirus, uh, you know, keeping our 900 sites open so that we can do the things that we do to support it, and most importantly, keep our colleagues safe while we do it. So, the intensity has been off the charts for sure, Jeff. So, Mark, uh, how's uh, the pandemic changed um, the way you work with various stakeholders, uh, governments, biotechs, and pharmacos? Yeah, so government relations, other than regulatory, historically has been a very small proportion of what we've been doing, right? A lot of what we've been doing is directly with our customers, whether it was a hospital, a pharmaceutical company, and now government has become, you know, an absolutely essential enabler of the response. Everything from dramatically accelerated regulatory pathways on products to working out all the logistics that we need to do to ship products and all of the things that you would never even think much about government relations to do. And so, so that's become very significantly different. And for a big global company uh, with, you know, with half of our colleagues in the US, historically, we would have spent very little time working at the state level. And because of the response in the US is primarily at the state level, we've been working aggressively to support the 50 states, right? Which from a management bandwidth perspective has been an interesting challenge, right? Which is, you really want staff to do that and now, now we're doing that well. On farm and biotech, and, you know, which is our traditional customer base and represents, represents about half of our revenue, it's kind of normal, right? Which is, they know us, we're reaching out, we're helping them with different things than we were doing in the past, which is how do they work safely? So we're helping them with you know, COVID testing just to even deal with their own colleagues but then helping them think about how do they screen compounds that might be effective for this um, virus? How do they accelerate vaccine production? Thinking through what, what if they're successful, right? And all of a sudden you have to scale on a therapeutic or vaccine well beyond what was ever dreamed of. Uh, and we're working through those various things. So that, that would characterize the relationships that we have right now and how that's playing out. So, so Mark, um, uh, tell us a little bit more about, you, you mentioned you're working with uh, state governments. Um, what kind of work are you doing with state governments? How are you helping them be more effective, Mark? Yeah, so, so Ramesh, the first thing is we're educating, right? And explaining, you know, make sure that the states understand their choices, right? Which is, you know, both antibody testing, the actual virology testing, as well as point of care versus central lab and just give them the basic of the landscape so they can think about what do they make sure that they're really pursuing a strategy that makes sense for their population. So we do, we do some basic education because what we want to do is have enough capacity, whoever provides it, so that they can actually get the economies up and running, right? So we do that. And then we have collaborated with a number of states to one, help their labs really ramp up the ability to do the testing and give them assurance of supply. So, so we've identified labs, we've moved equipment within the state to those labs to scale them up. And then in certain states, they've asked us to commit longer term to be able to support a real dramatic ramp up in testing. And we've done that as well. And um, we did an announcement, we've done one public announcement, which was Ohio, where we've, we've talked about what we're doing there. Got it, Mark. Now, um, you, you are playing such a fundamental role uh, during this uh, crisis. As you think about return uh, and, and helping and enabling uh, return, how are you uh, uh, thinking about uh, helping the world, especially in terms of therapeutics, vaccines, mm -hmm. all the various products where you enable your customers to do more, uh, Mark? 
Yeah, so, so when I think about return, I think about it from two lenses. The lens, first of all, about operating the company, and then the lens about how do we enable society to accelerate. So we've learned a lot because we've been a, living in a COVID world since China had this, um, effectively on how do you, you know, how do you have a low density population work safely in your facilities and keep people safe. So we've learned a lot about what return to work looks like in this environment. And now we're really working on how do you scale that um, to have society be able to address it. What's the role of testing? And how do you do the testing, make it widely available? How do you then do the tracing and the isolation and help governments think through that? And at the same point, really what will help accelerate the ramp up is not just the information about testing and isolation, but what you really want to have is testing and some therapeutic of a sort, even if it's helped blunt the, the symptoms, and then ultimately a vaccine where we can live in a post-COVID world, or at least for those people that are at the high risk you know, have a level of acceptability, kind of like the flu, right? Which is, we don't, we don't not go out because we might get the flu, right? Because, and some people get very sick or even pass away from the flu, but we need to get to a point where you can get to an acceptable level of risk from the coronavirus. And we need to implement those strategies to do that. Mark, um, as I uh, reflect and as I even hear your comments, this, this I'm sure has, has uh, challenged your own leadership style. You've been CEO for a long time. How has this uh, changed uh, your own style as a leader and CEO, Mark? Yeah, so the, there's a couple things that I personally adjusted, right? Which is some of the messaging that we were giving to our organization was challenging, right? And, and when you normally do that, you really like to have your frontline leader be able to communicate that because they have a relationship with a colleague. And given the pace of change that you know, we were addressing, you know, I did global town halls and I'm super candid. I've walked the factory floors, I've been here a long time, right? And, you know, and I gave the good news and the bad news, I gave the gratitude and skipped all of the layers, right? And our colleagues hugely valued that. But at the same point, it makes your management team less effective, right? And therefore, a lot of just re reestablishing the normalcy as part of it has been a real lesson learned. And it wasn't that I wasn't aware of what I was doing, but I didn't want to have to have, you know, 10,000 managers communicate any level of bad news when I wouldn't be able to really educate them and put them in a position to be successful. And therefore, you make trade-offs. And you know, generally the feedback has been positive, but you know, it hasn't been entirely positive and um, I wouldn't expect it to be. So I think that's one of the things that I've learned. And the other thing that I've learned is no matter what the message is, you can't over communicate enough, right? I, I, I always believe that, but until you, you know, the cadence of communication has really been very important to be able to navigate this time. Yeah. Now we are hearing this from many people, Mark, that just the, the, the need for over communication and keeping people engaged and involved. We are hearing that from uh, many folks. So it's, it's interesting to see you hear you also talk about it. Um, Mark, as you uh, look into the future, what gives you hope uh, with, uh, with, with all this going on? You know, the, the thing that gives me hope is the best minds in the world are focused on addressing the challenge at hand. And I have tremendous confidence that with the brain power and the investment that's happening, that we'll look back on this time and say, amazing how society responded to put this behind us. And it's gonna take some time, but, but I'm actually optimistic that there'll be therapies, eventually a vaccine, and that testing strategies will be put in place across the world that facilitates some new normal uh, for a while. And, and I think so. I, I'm an optimist in that perspective. Well, Mark, thank you for spending the time with us today. Um, what you and Thermo Fisher Scientific are doing is inspiring uh, and living the company's mission. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you. Sure.